be with you today uh, to talk about China's evolving participation in the uh, global IP ecosystem. There's much, much discussed topic and, uh, and uh, lots of uh, uh, articles have been written about the changing nature of, uh, of China's approach to, uh, to filing, to uh, maintenance of portfolios. Uh, what we wanted to do today was uh, provide a, per- perhaps a different take than you may have heard before on uh, the nature of, uh, of how we're inventing uh, and how the world is shifting in terms of becoming much more software centric. And with that, the changes that have, that have impacted uh, China's approach to uh, filing and maintaining portfolios and utilizing portfolios and their global participation. Uh, slide one, please. Slide two, please. And as part of this, uh, it's important to understand that the world that we're living living in is one where every electronic touch uh, today is Linux and open source software enabled. Uh, we tend not to think about this because Linux is not necessarily branded, but every mobile phone, every uh, uh, smartphone that exists in the world today uh, has Linux code in it. Uh, the largest market share is with Android. Android has a uh, a very significant market share through uh, Huawei and through uh, LG, Samsung, and others uh, who are leaders in that space. They're all implementing around a Linux platform, which is the operating system on which uh, uh, Android is built is essentially the uh, the kernel uh, of Linux. And so uh, the, the Chromebook revolution, it's a quiet revolution. I think people have been focused so much on smartphones that they've focused a little less on the, in the significant impact that uh, Chromebooks have had, which also run on a Linux kernel. Uh, autonomous vehicle systems, whether it's the Chinese platform that Baidu has, which is Apollo, or whether it's the platforms developed by uh, any of the American or European uh, car companies that are developing um, uh, autonomous platforms. Obviously, Google, every search you do on Google, uh, every search you do on any platform, for that matter, is run on uh, on Linux. The New York Stock Exchange, stock exchanges all around the world, uh, commodities exchanges all run on Linux. Air traffic control systems, the lights that we cross at, uh, at uh, on street corners, uh, the cloud, uh, all cloud implementations utilize various levels of Linux, uh, even the Azure platform or uh, the Amazon platform. Uh, they all incorporate and utilize Linux. Uh, it's a, uh, a pervasive uh, modality. Linux is about ushering in a new way of creating value in the new economy where where we're collaborating to be able to uh, to deliver new value, recognizing that siloed development is something that doesn't allow us uh, to be able to maximize the opportunities for innovation at the core of, uh, of software de- software platforms. Uh, next slide, please. And as I said, this movement to software and away from hardware, there are very few companies five years from now that will define themselves as hardware companies uh, that will still be in existence. Uh, everybody is rushing to incorporate more software, more flex- flexibility and more fungibility of devices that we rely on to be able to uh, entertain, to be able to educate and to be able to communicate. Uh, again, this notion of collaboration is in- is uh, is central to what open source is about. It's the idea that one plus one plus one doesn't equal three, it equals six or 10 or 20. When we bring smart people from around the world uh, to work together on solving technical issues in software, uh, and that breaking down of barriers is incredibly important uh, to be able to deliver the kind of innovation and, inno- and uh, inventiveness that, uh, that, we, uh, that we've come to rely on. The level of diversity uh, drives inventiveness, and there are higher levels of innovation as a result. Uh, next slide, please. Open source project development is one of the the key ways that collaborate that this collaboration modality plays out. 
Uh, you have entities like the Linux Foundation that man- manage literally hundreds of projects. Some of the some of them being the Open NFV and uh, and others that are focused on infrastructure for communications. Uh, the Hyperledger project, which focuses on uh, developing ledgering technology, uh, blockchain technology for banking and other critical infrastructure in the U.S. and around the world. Automotive grade Linux, which is creating the new digital DNA for automobiles going forward. Uh, Toyota is a lead driver there. Uh, these are all ju- these are all just samples of the of the projects and the scope of those projects uh, in uh, that are being managed. And it's where companies come together collaborate cross-organizationally, cross-border to be able to create new novelty, to create, to create code that can then be used uh, with comfort that it, that, that it can then be uh, supporting the next generation of products uh, and uh, support iterative innovation. Next slide, please. Uh, and so the innovation cycles are, are changing. Um, the, this whole process of innovation, adoption, augmentation, contribution back and reuse is something that's part and parcel of what uh, the open source community is about and the open source ethic. Uh, the d- distilling the collective intelligence of global inventors uh, is triggering a corporate rethinking of decisions as to what, what is patented and what's, what's left open. Uh, and there are choices being made. There's an inherent duality that has now uh, emerged. Uh, and Chinese companies very much understand this and are are filing at uh, it, it's not just a t- uh, an issue of qu- quantity. There is in the last several years more of a focus on quality, uh, and really, I would say in the last five years, we see a recognition that in an open source centric world, filing strategies need to change, and reserving filings for uh, increasingly for low in the stack functionality. Next slide, please. Uh, this doesn't signal the open, the rise of open source does not signal the demise of uh, the patent system. I think quite to the contrary, uh, this is not, this is not about the demise of intellectual property. It's recognizing where to invent and where you can gain differentiation. Uh, and that's where filing is increasingly being focused as companies increasingly come together to be able to share, uh, their, their core inventions. Uh, in the in the software space, while filing uh, higher in the stack to be able to gain differentiation on the look and feel, the GUI, the experience, the customer experience that that one derives, uh, and there are community solutions that are being developed in order to protect uh, the the adoption of open source code uh, and have companies feel free to to adopt it and integrate it without fear of litigation and patent risk. Next slide, please. Uh, Some of these activities uh, are the the organization that I run, which is Open Invention Network, which was formed in 05. Uh, RPX was formed a little bit after that. Then AST later, Unified Patents about seven years ago, and Lot Network about uh, five years ago. These are all environments that, that allow for collaborative development of uh, and, and sharing of a patent risk. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about Open Invention Network now specifically. Next slide, please. Uh, OIN was formed, as I said, in 05 by IBM, Red Hat, Philips, NEC, Sony, uh, and later uh, joined and funded by Google and Toyota in 2013 and 2016, respectively. Uh, next slide, please. It has over 3,200 members, uh, companies that participate from startups to some of the largest corporations in the world. Uh, the companies that participate in this community own over 3 million patents and applications. Uh, OIN, as part of its model, purchases patents to support uh, clearance and the creation of an opportunity space for, uh, for the utilization of code. Um, we spent over $100 million acquiring patents, and, there, and we currently own over 1,300 patents and applications. Uh, and uh, the way that it works is we agree together. Uh, this notion of co-opetition is very much at the core of what, uh, what OIN is about. And companies come together based on the notion that where we collaborate, we shouldn't be suing each other. 
uh, because we, we need to be able to have the freedom to be able to use and adopt core code, to be able to build technology solutions on top uh, of that core code. And so uh, we protect the core. There are 2,800 core packages that we provide a patent cross-license around, and all the companies that participate buy into that cross-license obligation. Uh, it's a... Uh, 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 at the largest patent non-aggression zone in the world or organization in the world. Uh, and it's, it, it is, it, it exists because of the, uh, the rise of software and the rise of Linux and open source. Uh, next slide, please. It's a very much a global organization with 22% plus, uh, coming from Asia and, uh, and the balance split between relatively equally between EMEA and the Americas. Next slide, please. The, this, these slides are designed to indicate that the rise in our community development in China during the 2014 to 2015 period signaled a transformation in China and a recognition both at the government and at co the corporate level that open source was going to be central to China's ability to innovate. Uh, it also, it also Parallel this rise in focusing on innovating at the lower and the uh, higher in the stack and allowing the lower in the stack functionality that comes from software projects to actually be free from patent patenting. Next slide, please. This is just an example of the kinds of companies in China that uh, that are part of the OAN community. Uh, JD.com, Tencent, Alibaba, UnionPay. Uh, uh, HTC, some of the largest uh, companies in China, uh, and uh, Huawei just became a licensee in the last six weeks. Next slide, please. This is another example of by, uh, by technology sector, by industry, companies that participate in this community from around the world. Uh, next slide, please. Again, uh, fintech companies uh, and others that participate. The bottom line is that ultimately the only companies that don't sign the OAN license that participate in this patent non-aggression community uh, and agree to mitigate patent risk in open source code are those that wish to reserve the right to sue on patents that read on core Linux and open source functionality. It's a community uh, and what we do through the use of a, of a license that, that supports a, a broad cross license in, in core functionality of Linux and open source is that we're creating community norms and a set of values that companies can uh, can utilize when patenting, uh, but also developing and utilizing open source code. Uh, Chinese companies are, as you've seen uh, earlier in my slide presentation, are central to the growth of open source. In fact, nowhere uh, is there more growth in, in utilization uh, and adoption and integration of open source code than in China over the last five five to six years. Companies like Huawei have been active participants and, and contributors back of significant amounts of code for the past eight years. And so China is, is, is moving in a direction of understanding and adopting at all levels, not just the large to mid-sized companies, but all the way down into the, into the startups and the very young companies that are incredibly dependent upon software and on innovation to be able to grow their national and global footprint. Thank you very much. Okay, Mark, I guess I should pick it up. Yeah, please, thank you. So my name is Mark Cohen, I'm at UC Berkeley, and uh, I'm gonna follow up on Keith's excellent presentation with uh, a little bit of a, a, a short but deep dive into the current environment with China, which obviously has been a, a central part of discussion as well, particularly uh, China's emergence uh, in the global IP environment, uh, including licensing environment, over the past few years and the impact of the trade war and now COVID-19 on uh, China's role uh, as a major player in intellectual property. Uh, in looking at these two topics, both the trade war or the phase one agreement and COVID-19, there's a couple of very big picture of uh, perspectives that I'm going to go into. And let me just give you a sense of them as I, as I uh, discuss them in further detail. Uh, uh, so generally in terms of the trade war, I think what we've seen, and I think Keith's data 
uh, an approach reflects this is a uh, more balanced approach towards licensing. Uh, that is, China no longer views licensing as a one-way street where they're just having to pay for foreign uh, technology. Now they're a, a more active player. Secondly, a generally positive train, trend line in licensing, that is China is buying more. Uh, trade war has been a bit of an interruption in that respect and licensing out as well more. Uh, as Keith mentioned, generally also a positive line in innovation, uh, higher quality patents. There are still some issues around that, but in general, I think we can say that the trend line has been positive. And another item that's also equally important is that the trade war has been disruptive of the prior trends uh, and that we may yet see further disruption, particularly from COVID-19. Uh, in terms of COVID-19, what we're seeing is a continued increase in patent filings out of China and a little bit of a, uh, a trend away from invention patents towards utility model patents, at least for the first quarter of this year. Collaboration, modest signs that it's increasing despite the regulatory impediments from the U.S. and the narrative around Chinese IP theft. Uh, uh, we're seeing that um, there's uh, the phase one agreement is vulnerable to accusations around uh, 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 China's willful uh, non-disclosure of COVID-19 or unwillingness to cooperate and other nefarious accusations. Uh, so there's increased momentum towards decoupling uh, uh, in some sectors of the U.S. government. And I think the last thing, which is very important to think about as we go forward, is that there is um, an opportunity for opportunistic actors uh, and that the post-COVID-19 world may look uh, somewhat different uh, from the one that we now live in, not only because of the differences in how the U.S. and China respond to the pandemic and other countries as well, uh, but also to the extent that uh, 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 opportunistic actors on both sides, I think especially China, uh, use this to leapfrog themselves even further as innovative players, as uh, important factors in the patent world and in licensing. So just to step back, uh, generally the trade war has created a more balanced approach towards licensing with China. Uh, and it brought early on, before the phase one agreement, reform of China's licensing regime, uh, 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 which was necessary, although its impact may have been overstated. Uh, but also equally important is that the phase one agreement did not address high tech issues in general. It didn't address patenting and 5G or uh, AI. It didn't address antitrust uh, uh, and its relationship to, with licensing. But nonetheless, there were positive signals that came out of the phase one agreement and out of steps China took before that, which I think have helped to create a better legal environment. Maybe not a better political environment, particularly now, but uh, a better legal environment. Also, very importantly, people have generally overlooked this, is that prior to the trade war, the trend line was positive on licensing. From 2011 to 2019, uh, the average yearly increase in U.S. receipts, according to census data, from licensing of technology was about 13% each year. Uh, so it was an excess, actually, of growth in the Chinese economy. In fact, the year the trade war started saw the most dramatic increase, the, the year prior saw the most dramatic increase of 24% that year. When the trade war came along, however, we started seeing some decreases. And most recently, the first two quarters of 2019 uh, for uh, patent-related receipts, we saw decreases of 7% and 6% approximately, which were the most significant decreases coming after the most significant increases. So I wouldn't say that this is a stable environment, at least in terms of licensing receipts. U.S. data has its issues, uh, uh, so uh, I wouldn't... Uh, uh, view them as necessarily representative of the total sum of licensing transactions, but I think they are probably useful in uh, judging wh where the trends are. Uh, anecdotally, we hear more successful SEP cases being brought and won by foreign companies in Chinese ports. Uh, where there have been some recent studies, both public and non-public, on the amount of SEP litigation, uh, Chinese versus Chinese, foreign versus Chinese, Chinese versus foreign. Uh, and U.S. data, by the way, generally does not reflect court judgments, including uh, 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 covenants not to sue as a license agreement or settlement fee as a kind of license agreement. So we have to kind of discount all that litigation data uh, in terms of looking at uh, licensing data. Uh, 
In fact, you can say that given what was a positive trend on licensing prior to the trade war, you can ask, why did we bring a trade war that focused on licensing? And I can't really answer that question. Because to me, there's too many mysteries in politics. But generally, the trend line was positive, and some would say that um, the licensing issue was a bit of an excuse to bring a, a, a trade war on a broader range of issues. The trend in licensing is also mirrored by data on transactions of other kinds, uh, including uh, inbound investment into China, inbound investment for China to the U.S. And what we've seen in particular, the Chinese FDI is way down in 2019, uh, 2020, 2000, I'm sorry, 2019, according to the most recent Rhodium Group study that came out this, this week. Uh, uh, and so, you know, decoupling, at least in terms of investment, continues. Although actually U.S. investment in China was still about double Chinese investment in the U.S. Chinese VC investment in the U.S. was down dramatically as well. Uh, regarding emergence of China as a patent innovator, I think the trend line is generally positive, and I agree with Keith's assessment in that area. I do have a, a note of caution that some of the data continues uh, uh, both out of China and uh, inside China to be excessively numbers-driven, quantitative-driven, which is could be more reflective of subsidies and other incentives than actual innovation. I think a particularly egregious uh, a perpetrator of this uh, 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 false narrative has been WIPO, which has tended to look at PCP applications as reflective of innovation or patent strength. And China uniquely, I think, on its PCT filings, considering that it's now in a number one slot as a user of the PCT system, generally only has about 1.0 national phase entries for each PCT application. So using PCT data to suggest that China has a robust global portfolio uh, is no different really in, in, in ultimate impact in terms of using like Paris Convention uh, priority filings. Uh, uh, this is vastly different from many other countries, including the US, which is about three NPEs uh, uh, per application. And many smaller uh, jurisdictions like Israel have as much as six perhaps uh, even seven applications per PCT filing. So it, it's not necessarily the kind of indicator of strength as you might hope. Moreover, China's licensing and commercialization of its patents has traditionally been quite anemic, and I think we're seeing increased strength in that area. That's a good sign in terms of overall patent quality. Uh, the trade war also brought a decline in transparency in China and uh, some positive disruptions. Uh, so it, it's been a little bit harder to judge what's really happening in the Chinese courts. Uh, at the same time, however, largely for intrinsic, not extrinsic reasons, the Chinese court system has been getting better. We have a new specialized IP court. We're hearing a lot of foreign IP cases, uh, and uh, people seem to be thinking positively on those accomplishments. In addition, China has not been burdened by the kind of 101 problems that have haunted our fintech software diagnostic sectors in the United States. And for that reason, we can also expect that unless those issues are addressed domestically, we'll be continuing to see increased Chinese strength in filings in those areas, as well as increased commercial strength from companies like Alibaba, Tencent, and others. Jumping to the COVID-19 area, while I'm not a big fan of crystal balls that lack hard data, uh, 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 we all have a little bit of data. Let me give you a sense of what the data shows. First of all, as I mentioned, UMP filings were up, utility model patents were up in China first quarter of 2020, and interestingly, invention patents were slightly down year-on-year -year comparisons. This may be due to nothing more complex than difficulties in preparing more complicated invention patent applications. Nonetheless, UMPs do have value, and I think um, uh, uh, they um, uh, are not to be ignored by foreign companies working in China. We've seen some increases in collaborative scientific research in the first quarter, particularly on COVID-19 related papers. And this is a positive trend if, if it continues, if it's sustainable as cross-border collaboration and science has been under attack from the USG, FBI, and others. Third, we're seeing increased interest and support for decoupling, especially uh, our over-reliance, the view of many on China uh, uh, for API, for uh, personal protective equipment and other areas. And this could affect the kinds of licensing deals we see in the future. Although I think China is a very hard country to replace. If you're going to start manufacturing Taiwan, the Philippines, India, uh, uh, any other countries, you're probably going to start moving your licensing deals to that, those markets. And per perhaps we'll see some improvements in the IP environment in those markets. Uh, 
There's talk about, another point is this, talk about terminating the phase one agreement. Uh, I, I, uh, the president said that. I think this would be a very disruptive uh, a step. I would add additional toxicity to an already challenging environment. My last point is that something to watch out for is opportunistic actors. PPE diplomacy, naval encounters, uh, uh, other areas we're seeing geopolitically and in IP where people are taking this opportunity of this disruption uh, to try to advance themselves. And I think actually, regrettably, China is well positioned to react opportunistically. They're going to emerge. They are emerging out of virus. The, the pandemic a little bit earlier, perhaps more stably, hard to say, uh, but we are likely to see more opportunistic activity in light of um, uh, the disruption caused by COVID-19. Thank you.